cold outside and inside um, and, um, and and COVID transmission and everything else um, and just to reassure you I mean we've got this is a, a pretty good turnout for a freezing cold Monday um, on uh, watching online um, we have certainly at least 500 registered uh, those of you at home, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you are considerably warmer than we are here. Um, if you can see us rubbing our hands, sitting with our coats on, you'll know why. Uh, my name's Steve Barnett. I'm, um, uh, oh, oh, I, I forgot to go about social, no, I won't do the social distancing bit, you, you know about that. Um, no, no, I'm going to talk, talk about me, I'm, I wasn't going to talk about social distancing. Um, um, we've actually had a number of requests from academics also to have a copy of this recording. Um, so uh, for those of you, anyone in the academic world or students who are watching, um, then welcome and uh, you will be able to see this online um, hopefully quite, quite soon. My name is Steve Barnett, I'm a professor of communications here and this is my home territory. I have been for 25 years. I'm also uh, on the Hacked Off board. Um, why are we here? This year marks 10 years since the uh, phone hacking scandal erupted, uh, when The Guardian published the revelations that the news of the world had hacked the voicemails of the murdered schoolgirl, Millie Dowler. Uh, in response, the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, set up the Leveson Inquiry, uh, which actually started taking evidence in November 2011. Uh, yesterday, it happened to be 10 years to the day that the singer Charlotte Church gave evidence, telling the inquiry how the News of the World had published front page exposés of her father's affair, which nearly drove her mother to suicide. On the same day, Anne Diamond gave evidence of how a son journalist was found at the hospital where she was giving birth, posing as a doctor. Today, it is 10 years to the day that the journalist Richard Pepiat gave evidence to the inquiry of how he routinely made up or embellished stories at the Daily Star because of editorial pressure from above and was constantly being pushed to write anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant stories. Now, I mentioned those stories, that was, uh, those people giving evidence, for a reason, not because of the 10-year anniversary coincidence, but because they illustrate something that is often forgotten about the Leveson Inquiry, that the Guardian's 
groundbreaking revelations were about much more than phone hacking. They were about routine and systematic abuse of basic journalistic principles in several newspaper newsrooms. Most important of all, they were about abuse of power. That story was a watershed moment, not only for the British press, but for the practice of journalism around the UK and for those of us like me who teach aspiring students. And it reverberated well beyond the shores of the UK. I can remember doing many interviews with journalists from around the world who found it extraordinary that these kinds of practices were happening under the name of journalism. We all assumed that it would herald wholesale changes in journalism ethics and to the regulatory frameworks. And one of the things that we're here to discuss today is to what extent that might be true. Is power still being abused? But before we do that, um, we want to reflect on what actually happened. Because frankly, without the courage and the sheer bloody-minded determination of a handful of people, none of those practices would ever have been exposed. And I'm delighted to welcome four of those protagonists here tonight. Uh, I'm sure that Jenny and Tanzin won't mind if I start with the two who put their own jobs and frankly, their own sanity on the line to get this story out. So I'm going to introduce first Nick Davis, second on the right, uh, the investigative journalist who spent years of research. He faced vehement denials, threats, mockery, defamation suits, obfuscation from very powerful individuals before he finally exposed the secrets and lies behind those denials. His account of what was involved, of what's getting to the story, getting to the truth involved, is in uh, his book called Hack Attack, which frankly reads like a Hollywood thriller. Uh, it's a riveting read for anyone interested in journalism, politics, or power. Um, it just so happens, and I'm not sure if Nick's aware of this, that today is also 10 years to the day that Nick gave evidence to the Leveson Inquiry for the first time. And then there's Alan, Alan Rosbridge on my right, editor of The Guardian for 20 years, the man who had to endure the visceral fury of some of his fellow editors for daring to publish Nick's revelations. Uh, he won't be receiving any Christmas cards from Paul Dacre. <laughs> but without an editor prepared to put his faith in one reporter and take on the mass ranks of police, regulator, hostile MPs, and furious fellow editors, we would never have heard Nick's story. So welcome to then also to Tamsin, Tamsin Allen, partner at Bynum's. Uh, and head of media law there, who acted for dozens of the early hacking victims in the courts uh, and heard some pretty heartrending stories as a result. And then filmmaker Jenny Evans, who worked with Nick uh, as Nick's researcher on the story, uh, and I suspect will some of her, have some of her own stories of what they had to go through to expose the truth. So I'm going to ask you first, partly to warm your hands, to give them all a round of applause. Right, I'm going to sit down. Nick, grab the microphone there if you would. It is, it is on. You want to just test it? Have, yeah, it's on. Okay, that's good. Um, Nick, right, your work exposing phone hacking and all the other unethical practices, blagging, bribing of police officers, it went back a lot earlier than 2011. Um, and you also discovered it applied to more than just a couple of tabloid papers. So can you just start by giving us a timeline of when you first uh, found out the nature and scale of these practices through to your first book, Flat Earth News, and then through to that Millie Dowler story in July 2011. You want me to read the whole book I wrote? <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're waiting until we wait for the movie, yeah. I think I started to, is the mic at the right distance from the uh, I started to become aware of all this because I decided to break the first unwritten rule of Fleet Street, which is that dog doesn't eat dog, which means that we're not supposed to write the truth about each other in the profession. So I started putting together a book about, yeah, yeah, about, yeah, right. about falsehood and distortion in mainstream news, triggered by the tsunami of falsehood we produced about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but covering lots and lots of other examples. So that involved going to a small bar in Berwick Street called Bar du Marché with real French people 
and talking in dark corners to journalists about what was going on in their newsrooms so that I could get the story behind the stories that were false. And they started to spill some of this stuff. And I was, I was quite shocked. And that's because I was working for The Guardian. The Guardian's very soft. And what lies behind the criminality is ruthlessness. And it starts up the top with people like Rupert Murdoch, who, I mean, Rupert Murdoch is a pathologically greedy man. He cannot stop. He's 90 years old. He's still trying to make money. It's a sickness. But he passes that down as instructions all the way down to the features editor and the news editor of his various newspapers. Go out and get me stories that will make me more money, get me more readers. And ruthlessness is infectious. And against that background, people start to cut corners and do criminal things because that seems to make sense. The Groniad is like sitting in a large armchair with people bring you cups of coffee and you wonder how the editor is today and <laughs> nobody ever shouts at anybody or if they do, it's surely just because they're drunk. So it's very relaxed. I was never, I can remember any occasion which Alan asked me to commit a crime. You know, you see, that's, that's how he is. I tell you, we've worked together for 40 years, 42 years I've known him. I've never known him shout. There's no other editor in Fleet Street of whom you could say that. Most of them are in permanent shout mode. You, you, I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, you, you know the story about uh, Paul Dacre in all those years at the Mail, striding around the office. He has this strange thing where he scrap. He, he calls so many people by the C word that he's known as the vagina monologue. <laughs> Alan, Alan never did that. So, so anyway, I was really shocked by this, so, but I might dis but yes, so I was aware of the background fact there's a whole lot of crime being committed. And when that book was published, I was on the radio, somebody heard me talking, they got in touch, and they became a sort of guide into the story. But can I, so you, you, you started by listening to the stories of journalists who were telling you what they were doing, but what you hinted at was this sort of unwritten rule of, Street, dog doesn't eat dog, there's this omerta. Were they aware, were they telling these stories because they felt bad about it, they wanted someone to know what they were doing, or was it just a bit of pub gossip and they assumed that you were one of them and you would keep it under your hat like they did? No. The, over and over again, you find good people working in bad institutions. I mean, that's true across the board when you're trying to get a source inside the corporation that's doing terrible things, or inside Pretty Patel's home office now, as an institution, it's this sort of poisonous smell. But, but the, you, within that, there are people with conscience. So even at the Daily Mail, which is probably the most immoral UK newspaper, there are lots and lots of people who hate it, who hate being there, and who hate doing what they're having to do, and they're bullied, and ultimately they're strapped in by the, the need to support their family. So that, and also what happens is if you find one person who, who is willing to sit in the dark corner of the Bal du Marche, then that person confides in you and it's a deal. We, we never disclose who you are. We never disclose who you are. Come back. Yeah, come back yeah. uh, and then they pass you on to someone else. And so you get a kind of natural chain reaction. And so relatively easily, you, you work your way down this chain of people who, who've decided that they need to albeit privately. And when that first book was published, Flat Earth News, which mm -hmm. exposed some of what was going on, mm -hmm. what kind of pushback did you get? I mean, did you get, were there people in the industry, you know, you talk about good people and bad people, were there some of the, the editors who wanted to keep the lid on this furious? What kind of, what kind of... Um, well, I mean, people, yeah, people like Paul Dacre, you know, sound off, and he made a speech that was unkind about me which was a good day. <laughs> uh, eventually, he published 3,000 words about me. One Saturday, a double-page spread in the term, all about me being an enemy of the f of free press. I had no idea they were writing it, let alone publishing it. And you sort of sends a sort of strange tremor up. You might have I suddenly become famous? What the fuck's going on here? No, it's just a man who's really, really angry and can't control himself. Um, so you, you, um, I think it would be possible to exaggerate the threat that any of us were under. We, you're, on the whole, not talking about people who are going to be physically violent. They, they do violence to your reputation, if they possibly can. So, I mean, the, the speech-making and the tweeting is itself smearing. 
and people pick it up and repeat it, and that can be unsettling. And there, there was um, there were certainly tabloid reporters um, trying to find some dirt about me. And because I've always, and Alan too, we've lived a monastic lifestyle, there was just nothing there to find. But it's a spooky feeling, you get ex-girlfriends calling up and saying, what the hell's going on here? Uh, there were quite a few examples of that, people ringing saying, I've just had a hack on the phone asking weird questions about you. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't amount to anything, you know, I think in a way, I don't know how Alan feels, but it's, it's slightly encouraging when people like that start shouting back, because it proves that you're hurting them somewhere. You didn't, you didn't at any point feel intimidated or fearful that there were clearly they were going after, they were going well, after your private life. I think. Well, I suppose, However monastic you may yeah, be, yeah. I mean, that's not a I, nice feeling. No. I, I, I mean, there were times it's very stressful. I just don't want to overplay this because people have far more stressful lives. But there was a moment about two days after we published the very first hacking story in July 2009, which made it clear not just that this was the news of the world up to no good, but that the police were sitting on evidence about it. And two days later, the then assistant commissioner, John Yates, who was a man of high prestige and credibility, stepped outside the yard and held a press conference and said essentially, the Guardian had got it wrong. And I, I worked from home, not from the office, I was on my own when that came through. And I did get a flood of dread that I've always thought John Yates was a good guy. If he's telling the truth, we really, really have fouled up. And that was not a good feeling. And um, at more or less the same time, Rebecca Brooks would have a public statement saying that we had deliberately lied to the British people. And that, of course, starts running in the Murdoch press. So this is, this is quite a lot of incoming fire. And then, this was organised through the Murdoch Company's friends in the Tory party. He and I got, I was going to say invited, but we were instructed really to appear before a select committee about four days later. And, you know, we, we, we were being set up there to be, I think, to have our careers ended. Is that fair? Yeah. It, that was what it was about. It was not good. And it is right just to fill this in, because it's very often the case as a reporter that you know for sure what the truth is. You've spoken to the people, you've seen the documents. But it's also very common that you can't use those documents or sources in a public place. It's all off the record. You can't say you've seen it. Therefore, you can't prove that what you're saying is true. And I think the people in the Murdoch company, being journalists, could, could decode the story that we published and see that it didn't quote a single on-the-record source. Ha-ha, these people have got no defence, they can't prove a word of it. So, potentially, we were going to appear in front of that committee, and they say, well, how, have you got any proof at all for any of this? And the answer is, no, sorry, okay, end of career. And then in the two or three days before that happened, one source authorised me to use some paperwork, and we copied it. And, and that screwed them, because they were not expecting it. And that's, that's the great Hollywood movie moment, where you produce that piece of physical evidence in the select committee. Um, I, I'm still looking forward to the film. A couple more questions, Nick. Um, you sort of answered this, but did you at any point begin to worry that the, the, what was obviously a cover-up would be successful. I mean, the, presumably in the days until you actually got that permission from the source, there was a real sense that we're not going to get away with this. We're, we're... Um, I would say, actually there were was, there was several points within the first six months when I would have been perfectly happy to walk away from the story. You know, the normal thing is you work a long time on some investigation, you publish something big, you follow it up a couple of times, and then you go off to the next exciting adventure. And it would have been fine to do the select committee hearing, maybe. We've proved the basic point, walk away. But we couldn't because they kept on attacking us. So it wasn't that long after that that the intellectually entirely corrupt Press Complaints Commission put out a report that said the Guardian had got it all wrong. Yeah. And the newspaper publishing it, this was humiliating and bad for the paper. And so we had to come back in. So, uh, you see, they compelled us to keep going so that if I had known back then when I started working on it that I was going to end up on it for seven years, which is past the end of the Brooks-Coulson trial at the Old Bailey, I would have said, no, thank you. 
And, or if you parachuted me in halfway and said, okay, you've done three and a half years on this, you've got at least that much again, and you don't know what the end's going to be, I would say, can I get in the time machine, go back and decide not to do it? Do you, see? you don't know while you're in it what the outcome's going to be, and that can be stressful. But From here, you're cool. But you really, you, I mean, if you had known at the beginning, it would be seven yeah. years of your life. Yeah, it's ridiculous to spend seven years on one story. Despite what was, actually, yeah. in the end, you, a you, phenomenal story. Yeah. This experience put me off being a journalist. That may not be what you want me to say. But uh, this was my moment of maximum power. I, I came into journalism uh, off the back of the Watergate scandal. Okay? Two, two men armed with notebooks and pens bring down the most powerful man in the world by writing words about him. What a thrilling idea that, that you could create change by writing stories. And I, I think actually in the late 70s when I started, that was reasonably viable. For a series of background reasons, that got less and less possible. I wouldn't say it's impossible, it's because it's much less likely to happen. And so the experience of going through a lot of hard work, which I didn't intend to do quite so much, I got dragged into it, plus stress, thinking you've got it wrong or whatever, people finding out about your private life, then you hit this moment of maximum power. I never had more power as a writer than when this thing blew up 10 years ago. And I understood we're not going to suddenly change the superstructure of power in this country. This Australian with an American passport will still get cups of tea in Downing Street so he can tell a Democratic new government what to do. But I did think we might get a decent regulator. I did think that. And that didn't happen. So you said at the beginning, this is partly about what did we achieve. Yeah. I say nothing significant. Uh, what did we achieve? We probably, we probably reduced the level of, of criminality in Fleet Street to something close to zero. Who knows, maybe even zero, I don't know. Close. But I don't think that's a particularly interesting achievement. We haven't stopped, we haven't stopped all that collusion among the parallel. Did, let me tell you a story that hasn't been told properly. My reason for wanting to be involved in the story at all at the beginning was when I understood this is not just that the news of the world are committing crime. The police have the evidence and they've chosen not to pursue it. Why? Well, the answer is a bit complicated, but a big part of it is don't get into a fight with Rupert. Okay. Seven years pass. We have that big trial at the Old Bailey, Andy Coulson, Rebecca Brooks. It finishes. I put a front page story in The Guardian the next morning, and the, the nose of the story says, Scotland Yard have told Rupert Murdoch that they want to interview him as a suspect, under caution. Not a witness. You sit there, Rupert, we're going to interview you about whether or not you've been involved in criminal conspiracy. Okay. The Murdoch crew went berserk, and their lawyers rained down furious letters on the senior parts of the Metropolitan Police. The Metropolitan Police reacted by setting up a leaks inquiry. And I was uh, approached by two senior officers from the Anti-Corruption Command, trying to find out where I'd got the story. Meanwhile, the interview with Rupert was cancelled. I know of no other person in this country who has ever been able to say to the police, you want to interview me? You can't. And they'd say, ah, we back off. So what did we achieve? We, we didn't even teach Scotland Yard the lesson that they needed to stand up to this bully. They cowed out after all that had come out, after senior people's commissioner resigned over this. That assistant commissioner, John Yates, resigned. But the basic problem that senior people in the power elite in this country are frightened of Rupert Murdoch remains unchanged. And so I thought, I've had enough. I'm going to go off and enjoy my life. So if we start with the premise that the story was about abuse of power, you, your conclusion is that that power is still being wielded and abused? Uh, I would say Certainly. So. Um, to me, actually, the, the worst form of abuse of power isn't the criminality and the invasion of privacy. It isn't the ethical stuff. It's the, the very first clause of that code of conduct which these organizations claim to want to stick by requires them to correct any false or misleading information which they publish. The core abuse that really matters is that they ignore that, story after story, day after day. If they abided by that clause, this country would still be in the European Union. 
at the top end of the Or at the lower end of the scale. At the lower end of the scale, every day there are people who pick up a newspaper and read a story about themselves and say, but that's not me, that never happened. So that is an utter disgrace. And they do that relentlessly, routinely. So we might have stopped a bit of criminality, but if we haven't stopped them distorting the truth over and over, day after day, we didn't achieve anything important. Okay, I mean, we're gonna say a little bit about that in the second bit, where we're, uh, we're talking about where we are now. Alan, um, in your book, I'm not only here to promote everyone else's book, <laughs> which is called Breaking News, uh, and which I also recommend. You talk about two moments when Nick came to see you. The first, which you call the sliding doors moment, is when I think that was around 2005, when he first said he wanted to write about the press. And then the second was when he came with serious allegations of phone hacking, which I think you call the, the heart attack conversation. Um, just talk us through your first reaction when Nick comes to see you with these allegations about essentially colleagues, co-publishers, co-editors. What was your instinctive reaction? I, I don't want to touch this or I, we have to go with it. Well, I've always felt that the media is a very uh, underreported story in this country. I mean, it, would, it seems to me as journalists, we can't have it both ways. You know, we, we either acknowledge that we have considerable power, and that's, that's why we like being journalists. We, we want to influence things, uh, and, yeah, or, or we say we have no influence. But, but if, you, if you think that you have influence, then any sort of power needs to be examined. You know, that, that's what we also believe as journalists. So it, it seems to me wrong to leave a huge block of power like the media unexamined. And even 10 years ago, you know, a lot of um, newspapers had media correspondence and the Guardian had a big media section. Uh, and this was considered something that you should look at. But, uh, but I knew also from, from uh, I had been editor of them for 10 years, that there was uh, extreme pushback from proprietors and editors who if you publish something about them, would 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 threaten you. So when when Nick said that he went wanted to go ahead, he'd written you know big things about the criminal justice system, on drugs, and the police, and so on and so forth. He said I, I would like now to look at the media. And on the one hand, I thought that's great, and, and that's a that's a story we should do. I also knew it was going to be trouble because he is trouble. Um, and whenever you set him off, he always comes back with, with, with troubling things. That, um, so, um, so the first conversation I, I, I knew was going to be interesting and trouble. And the second conversation was when he came back and said, look, I have this absolutely mind-boggling story of, of our corruption at the various highest level of the, of the most powerful media, media organization in the world. And that's why it was a kind of heart attack competition, because you thought that this is going to be um, uh, dangerous trouble. So this is going to be awesome trouble. Um, and so it turned out to be. And wasn't there a part of you that thought, I'm really not sure I want to, I want to touch this? Um, yes, of course. But, but in, 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 in the end, you know, I think as an editor, you only have one role, which is to, if you've got brilliant reporters like Nick who work for you, your job is to get their stuff if it's true, uh, to get it in the paper. And if you don't want to do that, then you, then you shouldn't be doing the job. So, um, and, and you were going to be trouble, but I also knew that we had no option but to do it. You, you say if it was true, and, and <coughs> Nick himself is saying, you know, that there was the barrage of denials, obfuscation, lies. Wasn't there any point where you thought, you've put your faith in this lone reporter, what if he's lost his marbles? <laughs> and, 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 and actually hasn't got it right. Well, I mean, we, we both joined The Guardian on the same day uh, in 1979, and Nick's right to say that we have, we have worked alongside each other for a very long period. So I think with almost any other reporter, you would have those kinds of doubts. But as I, I knew Nick extremely well, and he would come in and say, look, I mean, there were one or two people he would never tell me who I spoke to, so um, I've got no idea who his you know, most secret sources were. But occasionally he would come and say, look, don't worry about this, I've spoken about it, I, I have got the paperwork, we can't refer to it in the story. And so you, you were publishing with a very great confidence. And that 
before that select committee hearing where you could finally produce a piece of hard evidence, weren't you concerned that actually there wasn't anything physical? This was all off the record, by, by the very definition of the conversations, they were off the record, there was no proof that you were involved. Uh, yeah, no, that was a horrible first week. It, 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 it really was, because they, they uh, around, I think we published around about Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. And by Friday, you could you could tell that, that news were very, very confident, and uh, they were fanning out in the lobby. They were briefing that we were going to be in front of the committee. The Saturday morning's Times had a gigantic um, uh, piece by Andy Heyman, the, the very senior cop, now in the employment of Murdoch saying we got it all wrong, they reprinted that the next day's News of the World, the whole of the front News of the World editorial had a full page editorial saying we'd lied, they put out an official statement of the stock exchange saying we'd lied, uh, and, and, and then on the Sunday, they had that, the Sunday Times then joined in, they were going to do, they were going to work us over, and I spent the whole job, I was going up to Scotland that weekend, I spent the whole uh, of a journey up to Dundee, of the train because it was anywhere a place where I could talk privately um, uh, in order to kill that story off because the whole Murdoch organization had been mobilized to sort of just kill this dead. Um, and so it, that, that was a very unpleasant week, wasn't it? It, it was tense. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, yes, that's true. But, 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 then, but, but then, you know, over the weekend, his magic source came out and said, don't worry. I'll, was, it, was, it, was it just the Murdoch press? Because I, the impression that certainly we get from the stories that, that you both tell is that this was actually the rest of Fleet Street more or less acting in concert. Um, well, the, the, the rest of Fleet Street certainly didn't come to our aid and they didn't cover it. I mean, this, okay. this extraordinary um, committee meeting, uh, committee room meeting we had, and I can see Chris Hume, and I remember Chris Hume came in and watched that, because yeah. um, actually we didn't have many friends in the room, and it was completely packed, and it was a completely dramatic occasion. And in most other papers, there were about three inches next to that. They, they just wanted the story to go away and for it not to be covered. Whereas objectively, it was a, an absolutely uh, astonishing occasion. What about your relationship with fellow editors? I mean, I, I assume you didn't get invited to many uh, lunches in the immediate aftermath. Obviously not at News International, but I mean, did you have editors, other editors phoning you and saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? Just lay off, go and, go and attack the banks or big pharma or drug trade or whatever, but leave us alone. N not, uh, no, oddly not, because uh, actually individual titles, they, they all hate each other within Fleet Street. Well, there's a simultaneous urge to circle the wagons if they feel that Fleet Street in general is going to be attacked. Um, so it wasn't the other, the other editors, I think, were, were, weren't going to report it, but they, they didn't necessarily not welcome it. Until, I think, the point at which they realized that the, the attention might switch to them. And the prospect of Leveson too obviously scared a lot of them, and they would do anything to stop that from happening. But actually, after the Millie Dunmore story, which was the great turning point, um, two or three editors, who might surprise you, um, got in touch and said we were very um, uh, sceptical about this story, but we have to see that this is this was an extraordinary story, and well done for keep keeping going. And there seemed like a moment for about five minutes where this was going to be a sort of Arab Spring <coughs> and editors would, you know, who had never normally spoke got together and had breakfast together and we said, well, how can we use this moment to clean up Fleet Street? And, um, and, and then the last and then thing scared them, I think. Uh, and that, that sort of moment of actually doing something really to reform things um, if I well, that's interesting that, that you said there are two or three editors who, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to name names, who <coughs> might surprise us, but presumably not from the News International account. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wanted to, to clear that up. So, just taking that to the, to, to the end point, because Nick sort of reflected at the end on where he thought 
he was quite pessimistic about where that got us. Um, there were a number of consequences new to the world, the firing of Coulson, collapsed bid for B Sky B, but what are your reflections now on the legacy of that story and um, the, 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 the longer term repercussions? Well, I, th I think there were two good things. One, well, as Nick said, I, I would be amazed if anybody in Free Street was stupid enough to be still using criminal methods. Um, maybe, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but it would be, it would be very surprising. And the other thing, I, I think there has been a complete sea change in privacy. Now, I, I think the, the techniques that Nick exposed were really brilliantly simple techniques for working over people's private lives. It didn't take much skill as a reporter to tap into somebody's phone and transcribe what was going on and, and publish lots of shagging stories. By and large, those have gone. Uh, and it's, that's not only the phone hacking thing. There are distinguished lawyers uh, in, in our midst who, 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 who have worked on that as well. But I think that that sort of has, 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 has gone. So I think there's, there's a two um, plus things. I think that the wasted opportunities, I, I think Leveson was very interested in the intersection between politics and power. Um, and I think that there was a sense of that, that sort of the, the court of King Rupert and the sense that you couldn't get elected as a prime minister without Rupert's backing. And all the, the fawning editors and proprietors who went to his cocktail parties, that, that was all going to be swept away. <laughs> and for about three or four years, I think it was like that. I think that's, that, that's all back to normal. Um, you know, my Lord Lebedev is, is you know, ennobled and goes into the House of Lords, and, and Boris Johnson wants his old mate Charles Moore to run the BBC, and he wants his mate Paul Dacre to, to head up as the main uh, uh, regulator of Ofcom. Uh, that sense of, of a sort of almost interchangeable chumminess between the press and power, which which was surfaced through the course of Levison, uh, during the course of, of Levison. I, I think that's um, gone. Uh, I think the, the concerted effort by Fleet Street to kill off Levison too was, was not a great moment. Uh, I think if, if so, the S in Ipso was supposed to stand for standards. Um, I haven't seen much evidence that Ipso has done anything on standards. Um, and, and, you know, the astonishing thing that Rebecca Brooks, who was on trial in the Old Bailey, uh, and her best defense was, I had no idea what was going on in my company. Um, literally, I had no idea. So it's now back uh, having the company, having spent hundreds of millions of pounds as a consequence. Can you imagine any other company in the world that would then say, we need a new chief executive. I know we'll have that one that stood dry at the old Bailey and I had no idea what was going on. And that, that is a kind of sort of two fingers from Murdoch to the rest of the world saying, uh, only I, I'm the only person, the only businessman in the world who could behave like that uh, because actually in the end I'm wrong. Um, so, you know, there were a couple of good things that flowed from it, but a lot of it has gone back to what it was. And of course, they're still paying out millions. I'm going to come to Tand in a minute to ask about the, um, the, the, the privacy issue. Last question for you, Alan. You, I, I, met, I said that Nick's book reads like a Hollywood thriller. You say in your book that George Clooney bought the rights, the film rights, and commissioned two script writers to write the screenplay. Where is it? <laughs> okay. We, we want to see the film. <laughs> That's another interesting story about Rupert. So, when I first started dealing with George Clooney, I said, you know you're going to run into trouble here. You're talking about a man who is so powerful, he doesn't actually need to tell people what he wants to happen. There's this kind of passive power. People think, what would Rupert want? That's what I'll do. So, over a period of years, the second writer to whom he's referred produced a 90-minute script for a feature film, which Clooney and all his people really liked. So then he's got to go out into the world of Hollywood and raise whatever it is, 20 million, 30 million dollars. And he couldn't do it. Even Clooney, with all his connections and all his prestige, couldn't. Why? Because people don't want to get into a fight with Rupert Murdoch. He, he owns 189 newspapers, all those television companies. They review movies. Let's not start the fight. So the whole project ran into the ground because you can't make a film exposing the power of Rupert Murdoch 
because he's got too much power. Surely these days, I Netflix, Amazon, they'd go. Okay, that? well, I, 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 there's only a limited amount I'm allowed to say about this because I signed a piece of paper. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but there's another project on the go, okay. which has got an A team involved. Okay. And so we'll see. If anyone's got 30 million to spare, I don't tell Rupert. This is a film. This is a film that we all want to see. Can it part, part of the tangent? I, I want to see who's going to play Nick and Alan. Um, Tanzit, you heard what Nick just said about things have changed. You were, um, you know, you got to know the people, the early hacking claimants, the way their privacy had been invaded. Is it true to say? Well, first of all, what was it like at the time? stories that they were telling you? And secondly, do you think things have improved? So at the time, some of the people who were mentioned in Nick's first article, people I'd acted for in the past, or press thoughts, or people whose private lives had been turned over by the tabloid press, um, they'd had lies told about them, they'd had their limbs gone through, they'd had mysterious things published about them, and they never really knew where it came from. Many of those people thought it must have been one of the most endearing to leak him to the press. And they lost trust in all the people they needed to support them at the time it was really terrible what was happening to them. Um, so that was the, the, the history of the people who were being mentioned in this, in this story. And I'd spent, until then, most of my career suing journalists and newspapers. And suddenly, we were working with journalists and newspapers. They opened the can, and the law was then the lever that opened it right up. It was one of those great occasions where the two work really well together. So we'd use the power that the court has to disclose, to the broader disclosure, to get things on the record. Uh, sources that had to be secret um, could be compelled in, in the context of court work, and they actually happen. But for all these powers that were we were able to bring to the service of the story, which could be told in a really impactful and important way in the press, and then retold in a way in, through the court and be reported as a result of what the courts came out through the cases. One, one of the criticisms, and uh, Paul McMullen, who also gave evidence 10 years ago today, um, famously said, privacy is for pedos, that um, anyone else, no one else has anything to hide. <laughs> Um, what about one uh, well, of the criticisms is that there is sometimes a genuine public interest in revealing something about someone's private life. You mentioned John Prescott, um, a, a very senior politician, deputy prime minister at one point. So, were there times when you actually thought I might be defending an invasion of privacy that does actually have some pub public interest? Of course, but that's that's the, what the court does. It balances. The, right, the individual's right to privacy with the public's right to know. And the court carries out this exercise of deciding which right is more important in the circumstances. So it's constantly in your mind, and neither right is more important than the other. So there's no automatic sort of slam dunk because someone's private life is being invaded, um, nor is there an auto automatic slam dunk because something might have a public interest to it as well. Their rights that need to be carefully balanced one against the other. But uh, apart from me, you mentioned Prescott and I've mentioned Charlotte Church and Diamond. They're all well-known people. But w what about the others, the ones that we haven't heard about? I mean, they were ordinary people, weren't they? Who were, yeah, who were absolutely. The and there were two ways, or well, lots of ways, in which ordinary people's lives were affected. One of them was one of the techniques used by the people that were hacking firms was to listen to the voicemail messages of, um, that were left for a celebrity and then find out the number of the person who'd left that message and listen to all their messages in case the celebrity had left a message for them. And then listen to the messages of the people who'd left messages on the non-celebrity's phone and so on in order to get a really broad sweep to pick up anything exciting and juicy. And in that process, people, the might not have been publications, but people's whole lives were being listened and at that time, this is pre-messenger, it's pre-snapchat, it's pre-any form of uh, <coughs> smartphone messaging. So everybody, people conducted their entire lives on voicemail. Mm. If, if you weren't able to pick up the phone because you're at work, you'd have 15, 20 voicemails at the end of the day, from the doctor, and your mother, and 
a lover, and everybody was giving messages for each other. Yeah, for, for those Gen Z people who are, are watching, um, yeah, phone messages were just about the way in which you communicated with people. I know it sounds a bit like kind of sending carrier pigeons, but that was it was before the days of WhatsApp. Um, what about where we are now? I mean, Alan's suggesting that actually things have improved, there's less kind of gratuitous invasion of people's privacy. What's your experience? I think that's right. It's the, there's been a steady trajectory towards protection of people's privacy rights over the past 20 years. The, the Rights Act, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was okay to go and have rights to go into a hospital and film a dying man on his hospital bed and then publish pictures of him. Yeah. Um, that would never happen now. Shagging stories is huge in this world. Not like that, no. I've never used such language. You don't see those in the, in the, in the press anymore uh, in the same way that you did, or if you do, you see them because they've been the result of the business of the elite, yes. Um, the police uh, failure to investigate properly when evidence of hacking was brought to their attention and uh, was one of the things that really bothered us at the beginning. Rather than saying, We've got evidence, but when Nick's story came out, rather than saying, we've got bin bags full of evidence, here you are, let's open this up and there should be more prosecution. They said, we've done our job, this was one rogue reporter and one crazy man, nothing else to see here. They went to the pages of the Times, they made statements, and um, that was all a lie. They did have evidence, but they weren't telling us what we found out later. The moment that investigation into private women and Denmark care was being uh, minimised, they were having meetings in Soho with meetings, boozy nights in Soho House, uh, and followed by a two hour meeting on the very day when they decided the ambit of the investigation. They were meeting frequently, there was this porous membrane between the police and the senior tabloid people at the time. They were friends, colleagues. There was a moment in medicine where um, an email was read out where the senior journalists were saying, time to call in those bottles of champagne talking about John Yates. And they felt they were indebted to them. They spent enough money on their public money, um, well not public money, tabloid money, on our public servants. Uh, I think I have to say. best friends with them. As a result of that, yeah. police were sitting on this evidence. So one of the things and in fact, it's a, a, a plot that Hugh Tomlinson and I came up with at a Murdoch drinks party. <laughs> Drinking a Rupert Murdoch's champagne, we came up with this idea <laughs> that uh, we should traditionally review the police decision not to proactively tell all the victims that they were victims of phone hacking. So at that time, if you thought you might be a victim of phone hacking, you'd write to the police, and the police would write back to saying, well, your name is on a list of people but we've got no other evidence, I would suggest you get in touch with your phone provider. And people get in touch with their phone provider and they said, we've destroyed all our records seven years ago. What are you talking about? We've got nothing to do with it. And that was that. So the legal case was issued, judicial review proceedings eventually ended with the police agreeing that they did have a legal obligation to proactively go out there and go through their bin bags and inform the victims um, that their you know, voice and message boxes have been cracked open by burglars mm -hmm. and their contents stolen. Um, and at that point, suddenly, there was, no, there was no holding it in anymore. So there was another way in which law worked with journalism to crack open the evidence. But it is quite shocking. Um, and again, reading Nick's book, it, it comes over very clearly. The, the, the continual obstruction and obfuscation by the police yeah. at the very top. Yeah. Um, and there were several resignations as a result of it, um, all with their pensions, of course. There are one or two things that the police now, and the, as a result of Leveson, their guidance said people shouldn't be identified on arrest by the media. You no longer get what used to be called ride alongs, where the press would bring up the, uh, the police would bring up the press and say we've got a good, we're going to go into a search tomorrow, do you want to come along? 
and so they turn up more powerfully because I've got a press and they use someone's house. It's actually good press. That doesn't happen any longer. Okay, so we've had, we've had some. I'm some ambitious, isn't it? Expecting the. Is that him? This is before. But um, there um, have been incremental changes. I'm going to move on to. Um, to Jenny, because time's moving on. Jenny, you worked for quite a long time with me on, on the story. Mm -hmm. um, did you at any point have, did you realise quite what a big deal this story was going to be? Um, yes and no. I think we were, we were quite frustrated that it wasn't a bigger story, that the press weren't talking about it more, and as a filmmaker that the broadcasters weren't making documentaries about it yet. They did in the end. Um, but also, my job for Nick was mostly to link up with tabloid reporters, those who worked at News the World and those who didn't anymore, but who had. Um, and what he told, told me at the beginning was, all information is good information, so, you know, if you get off the record information, that's brilliant. If you get unattributed information, which means you can use it, but you can't say who gave it to you, that's brilliant, that's fine, all information is good. Obviously, we do want someone to go on the record, and we just never found anyone to go on the record. Because they were all scared. I mean, it took me a while to even get in. Like, I was hung up on a lot. And people turned me down a lot. Although what, very what was your intro like? What would you say? I'm, my name's Jenny. I'm, I'm, I'm um, investigating the phone hacking story. No, I mean... Uh, no. Oh, what would I say? God. Would you like to buy a set of encyclopedias? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I would say I'm doing a bit of research for Nick Davis at The Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, we're just really interested in newspaper gathering techniques and they know, they could run circles around me, you know, so either they wanted to talk to me or they didn't and actually the people who ended up talking to me were the people who were bullied, so those newsrooms were horrible places to work I think um, and once I realised that and got to the people who were, had been unhappy and who had been crying in the toilets and had been sent on awful missions that everyone knew was, you know, a dead end just because they pissed someone off or whatever. They really wanted to talk, but not on the records. <laughs> and is that even those who had left their jobs, they were, they were just they were out of journalism, they had enough, they, they, were, they were scared? Yeah, they were terrified, rightly so. You know, it was a very vindictive um, body of people that they, would, they were talking about. Um, and they hadn't always left journalism either, you know, quite a lot of freelancers who might be needed to go back there, quite a lot were working on the papers, knew everybody, very networked, um, couldn't, couldn't risk it. Do you think, as a story for Nick as well, do you think there are still untold stories, or is everything out there now? There's so many untold stories. Oh, really? Oh, I'm certain of that. And, you know, I also think there's pro the focus on phone hacking is, is slightly, to, you know, a, a slight dog leg as well because I would sit with, for, with reporters and they would say things like, of course everyone knew about phone hacking, God, that was nothing. You should hear about, for example, blagging, which yeah. is known about now, but I can remember when I first heard about that and this reporter sat with me and he said, what we did was we called up the doctors of this very famous actress. We persuaded them that we needed her details faxed through. They pretended to be someone who had the right to have her details, her medical records, faxed to them. And he said, you should have seen people with dancing with glee when we realised she'd had two abortions. Because then she was ours. Then we had her a week, and they, and they could, they, you know, he was basically saying they bribed her not for money, but, but for information. You know, they always had her access to her then, and she was always beholden to them. So it's kind of a protection racketeering exercise they were describing. Um, yeah, so of course, you know, they did I mean, that, on record. What, that, what you just said, they were ours, I mean, that's really quite sinister, isn't it? I mean, basically, they were held prisoner. What you're saying is, we knew we could always go to them and get a story from them, because otherwise we were hanging over them, this bit of private information that we were public. That is what I understood them to be saying, yeah. Um, and, the, and the other people who have, we haven't mentioned yet, the non-famous people, whose lives were turned over, are victims of crime, people who accidentally find themselves in the headlines by yeah. any kind of chance, their lives would get completely turned over, you know, and they didn't even have any kind of exchange to do with, with the press. They, they, had, they had no, there was no, there could be no public interest in hacking them, blagging their information or printing anything about them at all, and they were readily turned over and then kind of forgotten. 
Yeah, I, I'm, and, and also, you know, victims of, remember the victims of the 7 7 attack, yeah. famously, that had the same experience. Mm. You, you're a, a filmmaker, so you're mm. used to dealing with the broadcast media. We're, we generally think of our broadcasters as being um, more moral, uh, more ethical in the way they approach journalism. What was your experience of the way they covered this? I think they were really slow to pick it up, and um, because probably because they were scared. I don't know. Um, but from my understanding, and Alan will correct me if I'm wrong, is that he actually had to take out the head of dispatches for dinner and say, why are you covering this fucking very important story? Before, dispatches were like, well, maybe we should cover this very important story. And then did some really good work on it. I mean, I worked on it, so I would say that. But... <laughs> Um, you know, then, then they caught up. But for ages, you know, going back to your question, did I think it would be a big story? We thought it was, we were like, are we going mad here? This is really important. And yet the police aren't really taking it seriously. And um, it's getting, you know, not the coverage we felt it should in the wider media. But you understood why not, that there was this culture of fear. Yeah, we, well, when we started talking to reporters, that's what we understood. But, yeah, I think that culture of fear pervades other institutions as described by right? Yeah, I mean, actually, I thought the dispatches, they got, Channel 4 got there in the end, didn't they? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Not more so. I don't speak for Channel 4. More so than the BBC. Um, yeah, I think there was a little bit of a race. There was a bit of a race between dispatches and Panorama, and then I think. Sorry, the BBC are cars. Right, but, but <laughs> later, I mean. I thought that actually the news coverage, once we got to Leveson, was okay, but before that, when The Guardian broke the stories... I think Panorama were interested and then didn't, for some reason, held back. I can't remember what it was now, what their reason was. And this match is over for it. I'm conscious of the time. We've got, um, we've got three more people that we want to... We want to now just talk about where we are now and the legacy. Um, um, I know at some point you Okay. Uh, right. So, where are we? Uh, our, our, our next three um, panelists. Oh, there you are. Right. Yeah, come, come and sit down. I'll, I'll shut up a bit here. All right. Um, we've got... Um, You're going to miss the best bit. The they've, they've heard me talk before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, okay, so to join us, um, to join us now, and just to talk about the repercussions and uh, what's changed, if anything, um, I've got uh, Hardy Matharu, um, who's in the middle, who's head of uh, regulation at the Leveson Compliant Regulator. In, no, sorry, I've got that's wrong. <laughs> Hardy is <laughs> the editor of online outlet The Byline Times. And the print newspaper. And the print newspaper. Thank you. Okay. It's been a long day. Um, Lexi, who is on my left, is Lexi Kakonor Kawana, uh, is the head of regulation at the Regulator in Press, which is Leveson Compliant, and a very distinguished. Um, on my far left, Professor of Media Law uh, at Leeds is Paul Rag. So, uh, I'm going to start with Hardy. Um, one thing that's happened since 2011 is that we've seen a lot of new independent publishers, mostly online. Um, do you think that that was partly as a result of the Leveson Inquiry and, uh, and, and the hacking scandal and a, a new generation of of publishers and enterprises that wanted to do something different? I think so, yeah. I mean, I can only really speak for Byline Times and where, where that came from. Yeah, I mean, one of our co-founders, Peter Jukes, uh, reported extensively on the phone hacking scandal. Byline Investigates uh, exposed a, lo uh, a lot of the wrongdoing around it and continues to do so to this day. And I think those distortions that were exposed during the phone hacking scandal, I think, you know, Nick was saying, you know, they're still, they're still around. You know, we're still seeing all of those. And journalism in this country is a massive power block. And actually, it's, it's still not being scrutinized. And those distortions are, are still there to a large extent. And, 
yeah, I think that has created, unfortunately, there's a market for independent media outlets because there is a feeling that the mainstream media, which is actually an establishment media, it's not just a mainstream, it's an establishment media, it's a power block, which is part of um, quite a close circuit of where power really lies in this country. And I think that has, there are significant distortions that which are still there. And so there is an appetite for independence. So with Byline Times, that's absolutely the reason why we wanted to create it and have a, a you know, monthly print newspaper. Because actually in our final analysis, uh, the biggest threat to democracy and justice in this country are significant and powerful elements of the mainstream establishment media. That is still the case. And so what we wanted to do, and as I said, I can only really speak for Byline Times, is be outside of the system. And that's really, really important for us. Because if you're to scrutinize something that is a system, and it is a system, uh, you have to be truly outside of that. You need to be transparent about who's funding that work. And I think there is a difference, isn't there, between, between the interest of the proprietor or a certain ideology and the interest of readers. And, you know, if, I, if Byline Times doesn't do what it says on the tin, which is what the papers don't say, uh, people can stop, their, our readers can take their money elsewhere. So, so it's, it's partly about being independent, not being part of the, uh, what you call the establishment media, but is it also partly a response to the, the ethical, the, the, the ethical dilemma that, that these are organizations that want to embrace higher journalistic and ethical standards? Yeah, and I definitely think it's fantastic that the independent media sector is, is thriving in this country. I think where we sit particularly is, yeah, journalism. So reporting, investigations, analysis, looking at the structural elements of, of why things are going wrong. Um, I think that's very different to commentary and sort of, ca sort of campaigns and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, the integrity of what, what we do uh, in terms of how trustworthy it is, who it's produced by, what are the aims of that, I think is absolutely essential. Okay. I, Nick, I'm just interested. You, you were quite pessimistic. Listening there to Hardy, isn't there a part of you that's thinking, actually, something good has come out of this? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, that's not a criticism of the time. Okay. It's a reflection of the fact that you... It's almost impossible now to use words as weapons to create change. It used to be possible. It isn't so possible anymore. That's to do with, number one, the impact of the internet, flooding the planet with words. So trying to get the focus on your one story is so difficult. And then beyond that, you're dealing with powerful entities, whether governments, corporations, or others, who have been extremely skilled and well-resourced in the arts of public relations. That industry scarcely existed when I started work. You look at how governments now have uh, perfected the techniques of ignoring public opinion. There was a, a you could see it happen in March too powerful than our ability to change public opinion by showing them facts. So it's a structural loss of power. It isn't for want of trying or wanting to change the world, just generally. I, I mean, I, to, to push it all the way, I would say our ability as individuals, whether as consumers or voters, to change the direction of events has been diminished to the point of near impotence. If you'd like to stop climate change, please do. Huh? <laughs> it's all about Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. I, no, 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 no. That's partly what we're here for. Um, Hardy, do you, do you want to have a, a quick go at telling us about this? Partly speaks to Nick's point actually about the government subsidies that are still going to the profit, big profitable publishers. No, you don't. You don't want to talk about that. I can. I can. Um, I mean, obviously that's good for them. But I mean, our funding model is always we want our readers to to fund our work, and it, it's a way of baking accountability into the product, really. Um, okay. I, 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 might, I might come back to that. I might come back to that. Lexi, um, 
many of the independent titles that we've talked about are members of Impress, which uh, some of us here are sort of Leveson nerds, but Impress is essentially the only press regulator in the UK that was formed to meet the standards uh, recommended by Leveson in his report. Um, is it fair to say that Impress is actually one of the most tangible elements of what came out of the phone hacking scandal and, and Leveson? Yeah, and I guess I would resist next point that there wasn't an effective regulator that emerged from the inquiry um, in response to the scandal and the pervasive power um, uh, that was used to sort of diminish, to cancel Leveson 2, to lobby the government, that continues to lobby the government. Um, because uh, the fact is, is that if you're you know, confronted with incredibly um, powerful actors and structures and systemic um, establishments, the, the one thing that you can do is organise. And Impress is not just the story of um, you know, uh, a, an establishment trying to correct itself, rather it's the story of the third sector of civil society coming together and deciding to organise um, based on integrity, based on independence, based on effectiveness, to create a new model going forward. So, uh, so no, the, the large establishment titles have not signed up to impress and, and they've created their own complaints handling body. But the large swathes of the independent media that we can reach voluntarily submit to effective oversight because they believe in a new model of journalism and they believe part of the new model of journalism is, is accountability. And so, so when we talk about the, the resistance, you're talking about creating and organising structures of change from the grassroots up. And that's the story of Impress as well. So when we first started as a regulator, it was, it was really difficult for us to get titles to sign on because there's no commercial incentive for a, for a, a, a publisher to, to cede power to an independent body to decide whether or not it's upholding journalistic standards. But they all voluntarily committed to that because they believe in this practice and model of journalism that's about uh, accountability, it's about the public interest, and it's about those, those purposes of journalism that are civic. And so, so yes, it's, it's a, a minority of the sector, but it's a significant minority. Our membership base of over 200 titles reaches 16, 17 million readers a month. That's a significant proportion of the population which is receiving news which is trustworthy and independently accountable. So, so I think that's part of the new future of journalism. So, so we can talk a lot about the legacy as being the legacy in relation to establishment titles, but I'd also like us to focus on the legacy of the future of journalism, which by and large is accountable and wants to be accountable to their readership through effective regulation. You, you mentioned that the, uh, the, reg the, the regulator has been set up by the, the, the establishment of the big publishers in so, um, And I'm sure if we had a representative from them here, they would say, well, we're also uh, set up to make our publishers, member publishers accountable. We stand up for ethical standards of journalism, etc. So what's the difference? I mean, in name only, right? Like, they call themselves a regulator. We regard them as an industry complaints body because for two reasons. One, one of the key elements of being an independent regulator is that first term, independence. You need to be independent of the titles, the newspapers that you regulate. So, for example, uh, the governance structure is set up. So editors of the, the, those titles sit within the governance structure that those titles must come together and decide if one of their fellow titles is going to be subject to a fine. Uh, they, they can't you know, effectively change their code because their code is decided by a group of editors. So, so that independence fundamentally is how, there. So how does it, how it work with Impress? How is Impress different then? So Impress is different in that our governance requires that, that no sitting editor can be part of the regulatory governing body. So, so, and secondly, no political actor can be part of that governing body. It's, it's unbelievable to me that a sitting peer is currently the chair of that body. No other regulator would allow a legislator, someone who has the power to make law in this country, sit on their governance and, and, and make decisions you know, in effect on that industry. So, 
So that's, that, that's one of the key elements, impresses in our constitution, in our articles, in order to be compliant with the approved regulation system, our governance fundamentally must have independence. So we've got all the expertise, we've got lawyers, we've got ex-journalists, we've got lay members who are ombudsman skills sitting on our board, but it, it's about the courtship between politics and the industry that, that, makes an ind that makes this regulator not independent. And secondly, the point is effectiveness. The, the industry body, IPSO, they've never run a standards investigation in their seven years of tenure. They've no. never issued a fine against one of the publishers, despite the fact, and Tamsin can speak to this, some of their titles have had to pay out millions in the last seven years based on private claims. So the effectiveness of the regulator is compromised when they can't demonstrate that they're actually willing to act on active um, standards issues within their sector. Impressed by way of example, we run an effective arbitration scheme, we run a number of arbitrations where people, ordinary people, have been able to bring claims against titles and successfully had those claims remedied with cash compensation through a low cost alternative. We've never seen an arbitration be issued by IPSO, even though despite the fact that they've said that they've got one of these schemes. And it's the effectiveness is, is the key. So the public need to trust that you're able to effectively regulate, regulate the sector and we don't see that effectiveness. I, was, I, I mean, Alan had to, to dash off um, for, for very good reason. I was going to ask him whether he would today join Ipso. But Nick, um, I know you're not a big guardian anymore. Should the guardian join Impro? Should they join Impro? Yeah. I have no idea. I mean, they really, really shouldn't join Ipso. That would be no, 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 no. Impro. I, and I don't think they would. Um, they currently run their own sort of in-house regulatory system, but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be the sort of the, the the final? It would be a sort of closure to say we started this ball rolling. We believe in this system of independent regulation. We're going to put our money where our mouth is. I think my answer is that if the Guardian were to join Impress, that would be good for Impress. It might marginally be good for the Guardian, but in the bigger picture of whether we're ever going to get an independently regulated press in this country, it would be a step backwards. Because what you, what really you want to do is, this isn't going to happen. But if we could return to the point we had in July 2011, when all of the national newspapers were pushed across the line into acknowledging that they need to change, as Alan referred to, yeah. and get all of them involved, if the Guardian takes its political weight for what it's worth and diverts into impress, they're no longer in any position to bring the rest of them with them. So I'm afraid it would be a step back. In terms of the big struggle. Okay, interesting point. Um, Paul, finally, uh, and I'm sorry, this is, we've had a lot of people on the panel, but there will be an opportunity for a few questions at the end. Um, you are a, an eminent professor, uh, an expert on media ethics. Um, have press standards improved over the last 10 years? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> You, but you now have 45 minutes to embellish. Not really. Well, it depends how you look at it, doesn't it? I mean, if you, if you think in terms of uh, legal claims that we've had just recently, we've had um, the Duchess of Sussex uh, bringing a claim because uh, private letters that she wrote to her father appeared in press in full. Um, and, and uh, then the newspapers uh, had the audacity to um, string out that litigation to keep her under pressure for as long as possible. They had the audacity in their defence to say that uh, the private letter that she wrote wasn't private because clearly she intended for that letter to be read by other people. And the evidence of that is that her handwriting was the meat, <laughs> and that there were no mistakes in the letter. This is actually in their defence. Um, they had the further audacity to say that um, there can't be any such thing as copyright in a letter, which must come as a surprise to, to journalists. I don't think they thought that one through. Um, we get stories like um, the uh, Stokes family uh, have gone through the cricketer 
uh, Ben Stokes. Um, you'll remember um, he'd, he'd uh, performed heroically in the Ashes. Um, helped us to win a game at Headingley that we really shouldn't have won. Um, uh, there's only one Australian in the audience, so. Um, and yet, on the, the sort of following week, uh, his family's uh, tragedy that they'd gone through was front page news uh, in the Sun. Now, they had the audacity to, in their defence, to when he complained that this was a misuse of private information, to say, well, this couldn't be a misuse of private information because uh, the story wasn't about Ben Stokes. It was a story about his mom. It wasn't about Ben Stokes because the story was concerned events that happened three years before he was born. So this wasn't private information about him. Whilst also saying at the same time, it's incredibly important that um, the public knows about uh, public figures, knows exactly what they've been through in their lives, so that the public can reach uh, a balanced and informed view on uh, their suitability as public figures. Um, so we still have this culture of newspapers thinking that anyone who is vaguely uh, well-known is uh, pri uh, public property. Um, we, also, we could also think about whether the culture has changed in terms of regulation. We're still seeing ordinary people who you've never heard of um, appearing in newspapers, having their private lives appear in newspapers and complaining to Ipso the press regulator. And we see those people's lives destroyed for no reason at all. And there is not an effective solution in place yet that allows those people to get the redress that they deserve. Now, we could have this. We could have an effective system of press regulation that preserved press freedom and protected individuals' rights. And I know that we could have this because journalists tell us that we could have this. Because it's journalists that have written the code of conduct that Ipso says it will enforce. So journalists can't say that regulation is a threat to press freedom, whilst also saying that they are an independent and effective regulator to uphold the standards that they have set for themselves. It's one thing or it's the other. So your, your point is they have codes which they've written themselves. It's a question of enforcement, implementation and enforcement. Yeah. What's the next step? How do we get there? Well, we need uh, an independent system. We need, we need uh, a regulator that actually has uh, both the uh, power and also the structures in place that allows them to enforce that code without, without meddling going on in the back room. As Lexi said, presently, when you study the Articles of Association, when you study the contracts that exist between member newspapers and Ipso, you see all of the technicalities that demonstrate much of what Ipso says it can do, it simply can't. These things are false. It will, Ipso says things like it can, it, can, it can make newspapers publish corrections whether they like it or not. It can't do that. It says that it has the power to uphold these standards. It doesn't. It says it has the power to conduct uh, standards investigations of its own volition, it doesn't. Until we have an actual system of independent press regulation that is committed to protecting press freedom as well as individuals' rights, until we have this, these abuses will continue to happen. There is a reason we are still talking about Leveson after 10 years. We can go back further. There have been regular public inquiries into this kind of malpractice in this country since at least the late 1940s. 
we will still be having these conversations in the 2040s and beyond until someone is prepared to stand up to the press. Now, I, for one, am very happy to stand up to the press. I take on board exactly the point that Nick made. When you stand up to the press, you make yourself a target. As Nick said, they will come after your ex-girlfriends. I've already spoken to my ex-girlfriends. <laughs> and they both responded very quickly. <laughs> and they said simply, who is this? <laughs> I would ask you to join me in standing up to the press. I thought you were going to say, ask you to join me. Great, very good. Ask you to, to, to join you in, uh, in, in helping out your ex-girlfriend. Um, great, that's, that's great. Well, thanks very much. I must declare an interest uh, that I uh, wrote a report that came out in June this year with my colleague, Dr. Gordon Ramsay, on IPSO, which actually revealed that the bulk of the way in which IPSO is structured was basically put to Levison 10 years ago, which he comprehensively rejected, um, uh, as well as uh, going over some of the things that we've, we've just heard from Paul and Lexi uh, about its, its in, ineffectual uh, lack of independence and lack of effectiveness. Right, um, I think we've got 10, 15 minutes, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Please tell us if you have any kind of institutional attachments that you think we ought to know about. I'm going to start, uh, I've got lots of hands, I'm going to start with, there are two at the back. Have we got a microphone? Could we have, the, 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 there are two next to each other, uh, very conveniently, and then uh, we'll bring it further down. And then we'll all go and have some, some to drink. Hi, um, Tina Bassi. Um, LSC, uh, London School of Economics and University of Cambridge. My question is, I think that it was last year, which was the 10th anniversary of Instagram, and the Financial Times published a piece that said that Instagram had single-handedly killed the paparazzi industry. And if you look at paparazzi sort of stories, they are very different from 10 years ago when Britney Spears was being featured. I wonder what the panel think of that. Okay, so has Instagram killed the paparazzi industry? And we'll take we'll take the next question, I'll take those two and then we'll, we'll, we'll get some answers to Hello yeah. there. My name is Dan Evans and uh, my institutional interest is that I help run while I investigate. And I'm a reformed phone hacker and I gave evidence at the... Dan, <coughs> you just hold it a bit closer. Excuse me. And I'm a reformed phone hacker, former okay. hacker for the news of the world, etc. Blah, 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 blah. Um, Mart, I just want to raise a point really about um, the similarity of the situation now as the one that you guys uh, encountered right at the beginning, Nick and Townsend, to do with the police sitting on evidence that they didn't want to do anything with. So people who've been following the story for the years that have elapsed since will know that, oh, I found the end of the microphone, everybody, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> they will know that there's been litigation ongoing during which there's been a vast amount of evidence that's emerged and been uncovered through disclosure and lots and lots of different rolling um, uh, claim cases. Hello. <laughs> um, and this is amounting to um, just huge amounts of evidence which show that, for example, Rebecca Brooks lied uh, and James Murdoch potentially misled the Leveson inquiry. Um, and then the second part of that, of course, being uh, cancelled as it was, denied the world the opportunity to see you know, this evidence tested. So what I'm saying is that right now, we have very, the exact same scenario with the, you know, the police aware, and I know they're aware because I've reported on it so many times over the years, that there's a huge body of evidence which basically at least raises a case to be investigated. And uh, the Metropolitan Police seem desperate not to do anything about it. Um, and my question is, you know, <laughs> Well, it's not really a question, it's more of a lament. Okay. <laughs> How have we found ourselves here still? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, if you could take, yeah, okay, we've got one, two, three. So if you could maybe take the microphone there and while the microphone's being delivered. Uh, Tamsin, do you want to say something about, um, obviously we have to be, we have to be careful about allegations, but evidence that is 
hasn't been, which we know is there, but hasn't actually been revealed or has been hidden still? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you mean. Is there a case for concealment and destruction? Sorry? Is there a case for concealment and destruction? A case for concealment and destruction? It's the name Russia showed the cover up that happened after you guys did your work. There has since been a much wider scandal of criminality. In the international? In the international, yeah. Okay. It's very serious allegations made. Uh, uh, it's very aware of it. Right. Police are aware of the serious allegations. Yeah, I find it very difficult to get police to do what they ought to be doing <laughs> every day. Um, and occasionally you can challenge them legally to say that there is the um, I don't know if I've got anything that's worthy of the microphone to say. But, but, but I think that, I mean, the important thing is that this. Go on. Dan, it's very good to see you. Do you know, Dan, this is Dan Evans. He used to work with the News of the World. He's an extremely good man, but he used to be a bad man. He was a, <laughs> he, he, he was a specialist phone hacker. Um, there's two things that you brought to mind, but I'm not quite sure which one you're talking about. Number one, just before the lockdown last year, there was a set of very specific allegations about a tabloid newspaper bribing a public official, somebody in Buckingham Palace. I was very involved in that by accident and the police took it very seriously. I had big cops, these cops they always dress in suits that are too small, hugely bulging men in my kitchen. I honestly don't know what the truth is about those allegations so when we say Fleet Street criminality has dropped almost to zero, there are allegations from time to time which are extremely difficult to get to the bottom of. But the other thing is, which maybe you were touching on, in the background, there are lots of people still suing over the crimes that were committed against them in the past by newspapers, and that includes suing the Mirror Group and The Sun. Where the litigation against The Sun is concerned, it's fair to say there's more and more detailed evidence now emerging about the extent to which senior people in the Murdoch company destroyed evidence in the gap between the Guardian exposing and Scotland Yard setting up Operation Wheating, the straight inquiry. At the time when I wrote the book, we knew that a lot of stuff had been destroyed, but it was just conceivable that there was a legitimate explanation for that. I think the, the, the legitimate explanation is in bits on the floor, that there was a concerted cover-up in order to stop the police finding things. There's a little detail in there, which is just interesting, which is that I didn't, this, this, at the time, so this is before the big trial, the police go into the Murdoch HQ, they're searching, searching, searching. They go to Rebecca Brooks's office, and according to the material that's been disclosed in court, they find she has an office in the, some sort of dressing room area, where there's a sort of dressing table or something, do you know this, Dan? and they move it, and then under it, they find a concealed safe, which had a laptop in it. And the last I saw in the paperwork, they'd never managed to get through the password protection to find what's on it. But th that looks like a, a kind of unexploded bomb ticking under the floor. But, but that is now in the possession of the police, is it? The, laptop, laptop. the laptop's been in the possession of the police for years, the, the fact that they found it in that extraordinarily worrying place has only emerged quite recently as part of the discovery process in the litigation. It's what um, Tam was talking about earlier, that the, the court orders the Murdoch company to disclose this and this, right. orders the cops to disclose this and this. The only other thing I can tell you is, you know the guys in the bulgy suits who came to see me? They said they were very interested in the civil litigation and they were watching closely the legal action against the mirror group, in case it turned out there was enough evidence to justify arresting senior editorial people from the mirror group at the time that phone hacking was going on. There was someone whose name appears? I don't know. Never heard of him. No, 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 you're he about. must be worried. But uh, when you say he must be worried, are, are you saying that th there is still stuff that he's going to emerge despite the fact, this is exactly what Neverson 2 was supposed to look at, despite the fact that it's been abandoned? Through the, 
through the litigation and the trials there might be something that emerges more? I think it's fair to say, I think that's what Dan's talking about, that those civil actions are slowly uncovering all sorts of important stuff, right. but none of the mainstream press are reporting it. Report it. And I mean, ultimately, there could be the prospect of people being arrested. But whether that will actually happen, I don't I'm know. I'm sure it will be covered in byline. Byline time. Yeah, absolutely. OK, subscription available here. Um, there we, oh, sorry, the Instagram question. Uh, how, um, who wants to? Go on, Jenny. You're, you look like you're on Instagram. Okay. I'm on Instagram. You are on Instagram. I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Anybody want to say? Has, has Instagram killed the paparazzi? What's Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> A man of the people. Is this a suggestion that Instagram with now so much self curated content online? Well, because the, yeah, the people yeah, they live. People are living their lives online anyway, in public. So yeah, well, I suppose that might be the case, but at least then people choose mostly to put it online. Yeah. Enormous peer pressure and societal pressure. Um, but at least there's some element of choice in what goes on Instagram, whereas perhaps the industry specialised in you know, excluding choice. Um, okay, I'm sure that that sort of right-hand column of the, 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 the male column of shame. Still has paparazzi shots that are. Mine's a lot on Twitter and Instagram. Does it? Okay, all right. You can tell I don't follow it. Right, there was a question uh, there, yeah, and then we'll have there and two here. Right, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Nicholas. In 2000, I started working in Unilever. From about 2002, I had a murder of media, complete takeover and destruction of my life and my maternity. The reason for that is that my job in Unilever was to shift money out of traditional media into other forms of media, which was a threat to murder. So 20% shift of £100 million a year in one business unit alone, which then translated into £40 million in the UK and £200 million a year globally was a threat to Rupert Murdoch. He destroyed my life. The evidence I now have is that he never gave up. And even though I won the case against this in 2003 in Unilever and they signed a legal agreement, he kept going throughout my life and I have a high court case pending on this. Okay. And so I'm, I'm, sorry, I, I'm going to stop you because we've, we've got a break for drinks. But that, I mean, that is a, another example of the kinds of abuse of power. That, uh, that we've been talking about. I, I'm going to ask that, can we have the microphone down, the down is, here? Is Sorry, question, quick question, yeah. investigating the financial structures that lie behind this? Financial structures, okay. Let's hang on to that. Can we have the mic down here, please? And then we've got two questions there, and then I think we will, uh, we've got one question there. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name's Lee. We've got a train after night. Uh, right. I'm just a concerned onlooker, really. Um, I have never understood why we have a situation in this country where the broadcast media is regulated, but the press is not. Why is that the case? Okay, that's a great question, Paul. I'm going to give that one to you in a minute. If, can we have the... the I, I'm going to... Uh, yeah. My name's Ian Puddick. Um, just, the police swear an oath to uphold the law. Journalists don't. Will, there, will the police ever be held to account? Uh, right, I like these short questions. Right, why is press regulated and not, uh, rule cover regulated and not press? Where are the police going to be held to account? Yeah. My name is Dr. Mia Harrington Stack, and um, I have a campaign on the internet justice for mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mia Harrington Stack. Um, I um, was an elite um, GP in Farmer, Hampshire. I developed a neurological condition, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, it was actually a, a dental procedure. Um, I'm going to ask you to come to the question because we've really short of time. Sorry. What's the question? There isn't really a question. The, there, is a, there is a campaign, Justice for Dr. Maria Harriet Stack, and I'm on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I've just been sued. By in the media courts for thirty thousand pounds for calling calling out a doctor, um, Doctor Cool, for not um, giving pain medicine. And okay, 
Thank you very much. I'm really sorry to, to cut it short. We're going to have one, one, right, good, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to, we're going to have one, one last question, which I think we'll have to get to Alice. Nick, if you, if you, if you need to run, if you're okay. Okay, let's have one very quick. Hello, um, my name's Andy Miller. I sued the Daily Mail. It took me 10 years to beat them, go to the Supreme Court twice. The one thing that you, well, so one of the things that has not been discussed tonight is the removal of conditional fee arrangements for the victims of the press. Uh, I'd like the comments from the, the, uh, the panel on that. And specifically, we happen to have a new Justice Secretary called Dominic Ra. He happens to be my MP. He used a conditional fee arrangement to sue successfully the Daily Mail. I went to see him twice asking him if he would support the maintenance, maintenance of CFAs and he refused because okay. he's scared of no that's, that's a really good point. I'm going to ask you that one. And final question from Alice, who is here. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a question yeah. on behalf of Hacked Off um, for our supporters and anyone kind of new to our cause. What do you say to those people that say, oh, well, that phone hacking business, that's all sorted now, that's old news. Ten years on, why should the British public still be concerned about the relationship between the power elite and the press? Okay. Right. So, Nick, I'm going to come to you first. How do we hold the police accountable, and what do you say to people who say this is basically an old story? Good Get a light. Can I get a microphone? Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, there was an amazing uh, report came out about six weeks ago by an independent panel that had been investigating the murder of Daniel Morgan and the police corruption and media corruption surrounding that. That panel came to a really striking conclusion. They said, the Metropolitan Police is, not was, is currently institutionally corrupt. And they explained that conclusion specifically in terms of the behaviour of the current commissioner, Cressida Dick. And that was a devastating blow to the reputation of the police. And, and that should be the end of Cressida Dick. She should have gone under a cloud, up to the nearest crossroads, to be buried in a stake through her heart. <laughs> and then, a mighty reformation of the way that the police behave so that they would be accountable. It didn't happen. So if you ask me how are we going to call them to account, I, the answer is I'm afraid I really, really don't know because there was a big moment there and we lost it. Okay, other thing, uh, what, what do we say? I'm being gagged. <laughs> What should we say to people who say, well, this is all old news, phone hacking story? I'd say, yeah, it is true. And personally, if I had the remaining energy and commitment to be running hacked off, I would not now be trying to expose criminal and unethical behavior by newspapers. I particularly wouldn't be going after, in spite of what we've just been saying about the civil actions, I wouldn't be going after the residue of crimes that were committed 15 years ago and more. Most of this stopped in September 2006 when Clive Goodman was arrested. I would say enough. There is a far more important thing which I referred to earlier and a far weaker spot. These newspapers don't tell the truth. That in, in, when you're a reporter, people throw buzzwords at you. You've got to be impartial, you've got to be fair, you've got to be objective. These words are crap. The only word that matters is honest. You have to be trying to tell the truth. All those other words are secondary to that. If they help you tell the truth, okay. If they don't, ignore them. Honest, honest, honest. We have newspapers in this country, immensely powerful, immensely influential, who every day of the week break the most basic and important rule of journalism. That's where Hacked Off should be focusing. Stop all this retrospective, digging out little bits of crime, it has got cobwebs on it. It hasn't got political power attached to it, unless somebody called Piers gets arrested. That would get it back in the headline. I, I, beyond that, I, I personally think Hacked Off is chewing the wrong bark, barking up the wrong tree. The only, the only place I disagree with you, Nick, is that I think there are certain other areas, in particular intrusion into grief and discrimination, where I think um, 
there are still I real, real... You know, you know how food packaging, you buy the food on the back, it tells you what's in the content. It puts a lot of pressure on the food manufacturers. If we had somebody like Max Mosley, who was a good man in spite of what the press tell you, who had some money to put into an organisation whose job would be to check the facts that national newspapers publish. You'd have to start off by selecting, say, five random stories from each newspaper because it's a big job. And then what you could do is you could produce a falsehood quotient, an FQ, and which you would promote every week. So you say, here's the Times. They have a false, falsehood quotient of 48. 48% of their stories are false. Uh, here's the Sun. Their FQ is actually 76. And you keep recycling this information day after day. And then, if you had a Labour Party that had a, I, I, an interesting, influential, and meaningful leader, you'd say, right, this is the legislation we need. Newspapers, news organisations, like food producers, must by law publish the FQ. Broadcasters have to announce it. So you'd say, uh, good evening, this is the 9 o'clock news. 63% uh, of our stories in the last week have been false. And now here's the latest round. And this would hit those organisations in their most sensitive organs, which is their wallets, because people would stop buying newspapers if it was clear what their FQ was. I love the idea of headlining the sun. Thank you. Right, I've been given a note to say that the live stream has to end at five minutes, uh, 15 minutes past precisely, or we will get cut off. Um, so, uh, Tandin, have you got a one line response to the issue of CFA? It's a problem. Kind of. Yeah, it is a problem. Funding of horribly expensive lawyers is a, is a real problem. Law is a way that you can hold police and journalists to account, but not if you don't have the money to do it. CFAs have given access to ordinary people. We still have CFAs, but they've become much more difficult because you can no longer recover what's called a success fee from your opponent. But there are plenty of lawyers who still do use success fee at uh, conditional fee agreements. So it's not all lost, but the government's done its best to squeeze. Okay. Um, I, I, Paul, I'm not going to ask you the question regulation, but you can talk, talk to us all at the bar afterwards about it. Um, I want to thank um, the, the university. I want to thank in particular Daniel Scroggins, who, is, who has been responsible for helping us put this, on event, this event on today, who has been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank all the staff at Hacktoff, particularly Nathan, and Alice is here, and uh, Sarah, his partner, has just had a baby and is watching online, I hope. Uh, and Fran is also online. They've done a fantastic job in putting this together. I'd also like to thank the panel. Thank, it's, it's, I think it's been a really, really interesting hour and a half, and I am really looking forward to seeing who plays Nick Davis in the movie. <laughs> thank you all very much.